the brain. There are four parts that we will go through for the brain, starting with the spaces inside the ventricles and the protective layers meninges. For the ventricles and meninges, these are the main topics you'll need to know. Meninges are the name for the three protective layers surrounding the central nervous system. The outermost meningeal layer is the dura mater, just under the bone of the skull for the brain or vertebrae for the spinal cord. This layer is fairly thick, like cardstock paper, but much stronger. The arachnoid mater is named for its structure that resembles spider webs. This is more fibrous, and the spaces within the scaffolding is where cerebral spinal fluid will flow. The last layer is just a slimy layer on the surface of the brain and spinal cord to protect it from direct contact with the surrounding fluid. These images are from a cadaver showing a brain on the left and a spinal cord on the right. The dura mater is folded back to expose the arachnoid mater over the surface. The pia mater is not noticeable as a layer. It's just a shiny, moist, mucus-like layer on the surface itself. Inside the skull, the dura mater has two layers that are essentially laminated together except in areas where a space is created for venous drainage. The outer layer is fused with the bone. The inner internal meningeal layer is what is continuous with the dura around the spinal cord. The infoldings of the double layer of dura within the cranium forms three major divisions, these infoldings. The falx cerebri is down the center of the brain longitudinally along the sagittal plane, dividing the brain into right and left hemispheres. Posteriorly, the tentorium cerebelli separates the brain's wormy appearance cerebrum from the stacked layered portion called the cerebellum. Then there is the falx cerebelli that divides the cerebellum into right and left sides. Spaces created between the two dural layers are called sinuses. These sinuses are the venous drainage points from the brain, as well as where cerebral spinal fluid returns the circulatory system. This is one example we can see the hole in there where there is one of the sinuses that would normally be filled with blood. This is an image of a venogram showing the drainage with the blood highlighted coming from the brain going through these dural venous sinuses. We can see another one of these from the posterior view. There's an actual blockage on the right-hand side of this image. To highlight the clinical relevance of this information, we can see there is an obstruction in one of the dural sinuses. In this case, it's the right transverse sinus. This image is a venogram that highlights the blood in a dark color the area that's light where there is no blood going through. To reinstate this flow, a stent is placed in it to keep it propped open. We can see that the blood flow has been restored in this post-operative enogram. The arachnoid mater scaffolding structure is conducive to allowing the watery cerebral spinal fluid to flow through. Inside the brain makes cerebral spinal fluid. What I'm pointing out here within part of the arachnoid mater is arachnoid villi. This removes the cerebral spinal fluid and returns it to the blood. So one portion, which we'll get to in a bit, makes cerebral spinal fluid. The arachnoid villi, which are these bumps on the arachnoid mater in these thicker clusters near the top part of the brain, are going to reabsorb the cerebral spinal fluid and return it to the venous circulation. This is a picture of the brain with the dura mater over it. Now we're lifting the dura mater so we can see more of the side of the brain. Now we're lifting it, we can't lift it any farther because the arachnoid villi are tethered to the dural sinus. And so let's look at this more closely. We can actually see the arachnoid and the dura connected to each other at this point. This is where cerebral spinal fluid is reabsorbed from the arachnoid villi and then returned to the dural sinus. The pia mater is directly touching the brain and it's located under the arachnoid mater. Cerebral spinal fluid is a clear fluid that is created within the spaces inside the brain by the choroid plexus. 
Cerebral spinal fluid is what makes the brain essentially float inside the skull as the brain is made of mostly fat, which floats in water. This reduces the weight of the brain by 97%. Otherwise, the lower part would be crushed under its own weight. Once the cerebral spinal fluid made by the choroid plexus travels down the spinal cord, it returns back up on the outside of the spinal cord and around the outside of the brain to reach the arachnoid villi where the cerebral spinal fluid will be reabsorbed and dumped into the dural sinuses. This is a transverse cut of a brain where the superior portion of the brain has been removed and we're looking down into the brain and seeing some of those spaces inside. Within the space or ventricles inside the brain, we can see some granular tissue regions. This is a choroid plexus and what makes cerebral spinal fluid. These are a summarized version of cerebral spinal fluid functions. Because the brain is floating inside the skull, when the skull makes impact with something, as can occur in a car accident or falling from a horse, etc., the brain will slosh in the opposite direction and make an impact on the opposite surface. One example would be hitting the front of the head while the posterior brain becomes damaged. This posterior region is where we process our vision, thus the person may report seeing stars as a result of the impact on that part of the brain. The formation of cerebral spinal fluid at the choroid plexus and the reuptake at the arachnoid villi are part of the blood-brain barrier. This barrier prevents large proteins and molecules such as red blood cells and hormones to enter the cerebral spinal fluid. Small molecules and ions are allowed to cross. The cerebral spinal fluid is clear. There are four larger spaces inside the brain called ventricles. Inside each ventricle is the choroid plexus that creates cerebral spinal fluid. Fluid created flows through these ventricles which are connected by channels or openings. At the bottom of the brain, the cerebral spinal fluid continues down the center of the spinal cord in the central canal. The first two ventricles have an arch shape from anterior to posterior and there is one on each side, although this view is a frontal view. The two lateral ventricles comprise the first two ventricles. The division between the two ventricles is known as the septum pellucidum. We can see from this lateral view that lateral ventricles are indeed horn-shaped, and then below it is a flat ventricle known as the third ventricle. The fluid made in the lateral ventricles travel through the interventricular foramen to reach the third ventricle. In this rotating view, we can see the lateral ventricles in red, the wide, flat third ventricle sandwiched between the two sides of the brain, the thin cerebral aqueduct leading down to the fourth ventricle. Exiting the fourth ventricle, the cerebral spinal fluid will enter the central canal in the center of the spinal cord. The fluid that travels down the central canal of the spinal cord returns back up to the brain in the subarachnoid space on the outside of the spinal cord, then to the arachnoid villi at the top of the brain. From the fourth ventricle, cerebral spinal fluid can also escape and go directly to the subarachnoid space around the brain. In this summary, we can see the choroid plexus is where cerebral spinal fluid is made. It will then flow down from the lateral ventricles to the third ventricles, down the cerebral aqueduct, and then into the fourth ventricle, then ultimately down into the central canal. The cerebral spinal fluid will then flow back up and around the brain to reach the arachnoid villi where cerebral spinal fluid will be reabsorbed and returned back to the blood via the dural sinus. You should know the location and function of each of the cranial meninges. You should know the pathway of cerebral spinal fluid. You should know what's in cerebral spinal fluid as well as what is not in cerebral spinal fluid. You should know what makes cerebral spinal fluid 
as well as what reabsorbs it as part of the pathway. Now we're going to work on the parts of the brain starting from the lowest most part of the brain adjacent to the spinal cord and then work our way up. The central nervous system consists of the brain and spinal cord, but we're just going to talk about the brain today. The peripheral nervous system is made up of the motor and sensory nerves that exit and enter the spinal cord controlling the body or relaying sensory information. Our focus on this chapter is the brain part of the central nervous system. To summarize a spinal cord, it's made of a long column of nervous tissue comprised of gray matter and white matter. Throughout the central nervous system, the gray matter is where a synapse occurs. In these regions, you will find the cell bodies, dendrites, and axon terminals of neurons, as well as the neurotransmitters that has been released onto them. The white matter are where the axons of neurons are found, which acts like wires within the wall of a house, delivering an electrical impulse up to the brain or from the brain and out to the body. The spinal nerves coming out of the intervertebral foramen out to the body are the beginning of the peripheral nervous system. Focusing on the brain, the most recognizable regions are the cerebrum, which is the upper most prominent wormy part with bumps and crevasses in convoluted patterns. Smaller, rounded structure on the posterior aspect of the brain is known as the cerebellum. Looking at the features on the interior of the brain, we can see the brain stem adjacent to the spinal cord with its three main segments and the diencephalon forming the central portion of the brain with its two distinct regions. In this chapter, we'll discuss the structures, features, and functions of each of these regions in detail. Let's begin with the medulla oblongata, moving up to the pons and further up to the midbrain. The brain stem elicits functions that are essential for survival. The inferior portion of the brain, the medulla oblongata, is continuous with the spinal cord. The medulla oblongata and pons contribute to cardiovascular and respiratory functions. A large part of the network of brain structures relating to consciousness and awareness is found in the brain stem. All the cranial nerves except vision and smell originate from the brain stem. Motor or efferent neurons leaving the brain out to the body and sensory neurons, afferent, bringing sensations from the body to the brain, cross over to the opposite side in the medulla oblongata. This is the reason the left side of the brain controls the right side of the body and vice versa. So the brain stem is comprised of the medulla, and pons, as well as part of the midbrain. As the most inferior portion of the brain, the medulla oblongata is adjacent to the spinal cord. The central canal of the spinal cord begins in the medulla oblongata. Cerebral spinal fluid from the ventricles of the brain leave the fourth ventricle, a space between the pons, medulla on the anterior side, and posteriorly by the cerebellum. Once the cerebral spinal fluid exits the fourth ventricle, it goes in the medulla oblongata via the central canal and continues down the spinal cord. On the anterior surface, the tapering down shape of the medulla oblongata is marked by medial longitudinal ridges called pyramids and then lateral bulges called the olives. The role of the medulla oblongata is to receive information from pressure sensors known as baroreceptors about blood pressure, then adjustments by the rate and force of contraction of the heart, as well as dilation or constriction by blood vessels are made to modify the blood pressure. Chemical sensors along arterial wall called chemoreceptors monitor oxygen and carbon dioxide levels in the blood. If these levels are out of range, adjustments are made by stimulating the rate of respiration. Basic reflexes of the digestive and respiratory system, such as coughing, sneezing, vomiting, and swallowing, also come from this region. Motor and sensory nerve tracts will cross over to the opposite side before continuing up to the brain or down to the body, 
Thus, one side of the brain controls the opposite side of the body, and one side of the brain receives stimuli from the opposite side of the body. The pons is the most distinctive of the brainstem regions, with a wide, broad surface that has laterally directed ridges and grooves. It makes up the part of the anterior wall of the fourth ventricle. The role of the pons also serves vital functions to survival, but more complex. The pons, in addition to the medulla oblongata, has influences on the cardiovascular and respiratory functions. The role of the pons is more of an integrative function that allows these systems to work together. During deep sleep, known as rapid eye movement, sleep is another role of the pons, as well as facial movements and secretions as cranial nerves from the region target the face. The most superior region of the brain stem is the midbrain. It is in this region that the sensory and motor pathways descend from or rise up into the two hemispheres of the brain to enter the cerebral cortex. On the posterior surface seen with the cerebellum removed are four small bumps called the corpora quadrigemina. The upper two bumps are the superior colliculi, which plays a role in controlling eye muscles to track a moving object like a bird in flight. The two lower bumps in yellow or orange are the inferior colliculi, which play a role in moving the head to orient to a sound coming from a particular direction. Through the center of the midbrain is a tunnel called the cerebral aqueduct, which allows the cerebral spinal fluid to travel from the third ventricle to the fourth ventricle. Anteriorly within the midbrain are two gray matter regions called the substantia nigra and the ventral tegmental area. The substantia nigra plays a role in motor function. Parkinson's disease is associated with neuron death in this region, causing tremors and the distinctive walking movements of those patients. The ventral tegmental area is associated with two pathways that lead into the cerebrum and play a role in emotions, feeling good, and reward patterning. These two regions contain neurons with the highest concentration of dopamine in the entire brain. The reticular formation is a column of white and gray matter extending the length of the brainstem. All the functions of the brainstem are incorporated within this area. This diffuse structure is the base of a large network of connections, which is why the functions associated with this area is so vast. The use of the term reticular refers to network, which best describes these types of connections that extend through the brain and to the body. The reticular activating system utilizes the pathways within the reticular formation of the brainstem to the thalamus, which will direct sensory impulses throughout the cerebral cortex, where we become conscious of the incoming stimuli. People that are unconscious deep sleep or even in a coma are experiencing a reduction of the activity of the reticular activating system within their brain. When impulses travel through the brain, they generate an electrical field which can be measured. Electrodes are placed on the head to detect the electrical activity of the brain with the resulting recorded tracings called an electroencephalogram or EEG. There are five main waves generated by the brain. During various states of consciousness from various levels of sleep through focused and to intense concentration, different waves predominate. Gamma waves predominate in a person that is experiencing intense focus and concentration that excludes all other sensory input out. These waves are seen in high level musicians focused on music or other high-functioning individuals that are so focused on their tasks that they're oblivious to everything around them. An average person that is alert and attentive or concentrating will display mostly beta waves that are low voltage and high frequency. Beta waves would likely be what would dominate in your brains while you're taking an exam. Alpha waves will dominate in a person that's relaxed and calm, taking a break to unwind while unfocused on any particular task, sort of like when your mind just wanders. Individuals that are experiencing repetitive tasks such as long durations of freeway driving or distance running outdoors enter into an autopilot state that's indicated by theta waves, which are slower than alpha waves.
During the theta-dominated state, creative ideas are generated or thoughts to solve problems are generated. This is often a very creative and productive state of mind. Theta waves are also associated with sleep when active dreaming is taking place. Deep, dreamless sleep or even a person under anesthesia are dominated by the slowest frequency known as delta waves. During sleep, people go through approximately 90 minute cycles of sequential stages of sleep, each lasting 5 to 20 minutes in duration. The last phase in a sleep cycle is the rapid eye movement stage where people experience vivid dreams and exhibit motor activity of eye twitching or other muscle movements. During this phase, the reticular activating system is less inhibitory and allows motor impulses to exit the brain. Now let's go on to the cerebellum. The cerebellum is known as the little brain. It's found at the posterior inferior part of the brain. It has an outer layer of gray matter surrounding the axons of the white matter. The pattern of branching of the white matter is known as arbor vitae or the tree of life. Input to the cerebellum occurs through various regions of the brain stem. Its primary purpose is to modify outgoing motor action with incoming sensory input with the greatest input by the musculoskeletal proprioceptors. Proprioceptors are a type of receptor that help your brain know where your limbs are in space, such as if your arm is up or down. Other sensory input is also included to help adjust any muscle movements as necessary. For example, if you're walking along and you step on, say, a puddle of water on tile and your foot begins to slip, that sensory information comes through your brain into the cerebellum and the cerebellum can then modify some your walking pattern by adjusting muscles to prevent you from slipping. You should know the structures of the brain stem, being the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla. You should know the features and functions of each of these regions. You should also know the pathway of cerebral spinal fluid through this region. Also where you can find cardiovascular and respiratory centers. You should know the functions of the cerebellum and the role it has in balance and equilibrium. You should know about the various EEG waves and what they represent, and what state a person would be in when a particular wave dominates. Now we'll move on to the diencephalon and limbic system. The diencephalon is comprised of three regions. It's literally known as between brain, and it serves as a relay station for incoming sensory impulses to be directed to various locations of the cerebral hemispheres. It also is the location of the master controller of our hormone and receives input about the state of our body, such as hunger, temperature, arousal, sleep-wake patterns, hormone regulation of re reproduction, growth, and stress, among many other things. The three main regions of the diencephalon are the thalamus, which is the main central portion in green, the epithalamus, which is superior, meaning epi, meaning above, in pink, the hypothalamus, meaning below the thalamus, indicated in orange. The epithalamus is the home to the pineal gland, that's the large bulbous portion of it post pointed posteriorly, which secretes melatonin. The thalamus itself is a sensory relay station, sending impulses up into the cerebrum. The hypothalamus contains our mammillary bodies as well as the infundibulum or connection to our pituitary gland. The thalamus itself is a rounded structure that appears to be fairly flat on a sagittal slice of the brain. We can see the rounded thalamus structures in this frontal view, and on the lateral view, it just looks like this flat surface. The majority of the thalamic structure actually goes into the brain on each lateral side. This is a superior view with the top portion of the brain cut off in a transverse slice looking down at part of the rounded bulges of the thalamus. The thalamus is the brain's primary switchboard or relay station that directs afferent tracks to various locations across the cerebral cortex. 
the function of the thalamus is related to the regions where it does not play a singular role, but just facilitates the connection to the other parts of the brain, particularly the senses, except smell, and connects that with awareness, which is the main role of our cerebral cortex. The epithalamus means above the thalamus, as the cells from this region are superior to the thalamus. The largest portion of the epithalamus is posterior to the thalamus, called the pineal gland. The gland influences many parts of the endocrine system, including calcium regulation, blood glucose regulation, stress, reproductive hormones, etc. The primary secretion from the pineal gland is melatonin. The secretions from the pineal gland goes directly to the blood and out to the body, as well as into the third ventricle and to the hypothalamus, influencing, which often can in, mean inhibiting, hormones that are released by the pituitary gland. Here's a posterior view with the pineal body indicated in red just above the corpora quadrigemina, specifically above the superior colliculi. The hypothalamus and subthalamus are the regions below the thalamus. The hypothalamus receives input from the body, tissues, and visceral organs. The type of input is very diverse. Some areas include hunger, thirst, arousal, blood pressure, electrolyte content, milk production in lactating women, etc. When changes must be made within the body in response to any of the stimuli, a signal is sent to the pituitary gland which will release hormones that will target the areas needed. Two additional features found on the inferior surface of the hypothalamus are two bumps called mammillary bodies. They are related to smell and visceral functions, mostly with feeding. So here's a summary as the hypothalamus. It really encompasses a wide expanse of functions throughout the body. It really is considered the master controller because it controls our pituitary gland. The pituitary gland just sends out many hormones that do the work of the hypothalamus. We will discuss this more in 202 when we talk about the endocrine system. The basal ganglia are also collectively known as clusters of gray matter embedded in the subcortical white matter. These gray matter islands work together with motor pathways to elicit smooth movements. Pathologies associated with damage to the, these regions include symptoms of uncontrolled movements such as tremors. You can view these distinctive gray matter regions of the basal ganglia in the unstained image of the brain and midbrain here. The limbic system is made of various structures that are within the borders of the diencephalon and cerebral cortex. The limbic system is really our emotional brain. This collection of structures connect memories and senses to an emotion. Examples include threat detection, facial recognition and associated feelings with that person, feeling fearful at the smell of smoke, or feeling love for someone often triggered by a smell such as perfume or certain food smells remind you of home. An area of the limbic system I want to direct your attention to is the hippocampus and amygdaloid body. Both of those regions are where our memories are made and stored. Both of those regions play a very important role in our memories. In fact, it is within the hippocampus that destruction of neurons here is related to Alzheimer's disease. The limbic system is very primal in that it elicits an emotional response to a variety of sensory stimuli that you may or may not be cognizant of. You should know the role of the diencephalon, the role and location of the pineal gland, as well as the hypothalamus and the functions of both of these areas as well as the function and location of the thalamus. You should know what basal nuclei are, that they're found deep in the brain, and their basic function, as well as specific parts of the limbic system, particularly the ones associated with memory.